And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, the, ma the mastermind behind Romance of the Perilous Land, as well as well as other materials like like the recent um, Wired Neon Cities, Qu the as well as Quill, and most recently Stargazer, and so and someone who has occasionally had to suffer the misfortune of watching a Braves game. The one and only Scott Mouthhouse. How you doing? Hello. Today, man? All good. Yeah, lovely. Thank you, and thanks for having me back. I love what you've done with the place. <laughs> I like yeah. the carpet. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, we rec we recently just passed a hundred episodes on the Geek Watch Sunday podcast. Congratulations! Thank thank you very much, man. Uh, so I I originally and of course of course you've you've been getting around because I imagine I suppose it, I suppose it shouldn't have come as too much of a surprise when I saw when I saw that you were posting stuff in the. Discord server for against the Dark Master and working with those guys. Hmm. Uh, but when it comes when it comes to star when it comes to um Stargazer, you you described it at you described it as um pulp as pulp fantasy in a dying world. So yeah, I know I know you were, I know you name dropped um Jack Vance in the PDF itself, but. Let's get down to definitions. What is pulp fantasy to you? Um, so pulp fantasy is something that grew out of the early 19th century. Um, sorry, early 20th century, and p possibly even the late 19th century, but certainly the early 20th century with um, Edgar Rice Burroughs, you know the um, Princess of Mars stuff, um, uh, C.L. Moore, uh, Joel of Jari, um, and yeah, as you say, Jack, Jack Vance. Um, and science fantasy is is that kind of science fiction esque uh, world where it might be traveling to other planets or something that's set in the future. Um, or it might have discernible, um, I guess, technology, but that technology might not necessarily be understood as um, technology in itself, but more magical artifacts or, or, or things like that. Um, so the, the kind of the Dying Earth um, stories and uh, Jack Vance and, and others, Gene Wolfe, you know, really attracted me, um, uh, and it, it, it's it's really about creating this this future where the 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 sun is in its last gasp, um, and society is reverted to this sort of feudal system in a lot of these cases, and you know, magic may have returned. Um, there are always outliers. Um, I've definitely not read everything in the in the genre. My, as you said, my main touch point for Stargazer was was Jack Vance. I'm only just now getting round to reading um, Book of the New Sun, uh, Gene Wolfe, which is mind blowingly good. Yeah. Um, it's amazing. I see Gerps did a uh, did a version of that, a source book of that, at some point. Yeah, but I don't. I don't. No offense, but I don't see you breaking out the graphing calculator whenever you're DMing. No, no, no. Um, I I'm far too simple for that. Yeah, I I know I know that joke is old hat, but I I will I will freely admit I I keep I keep picking on um on on GURPS lar largely because people keep telling me that it's the only RPG that one needs, which is yeah. which is not true. <laughs> people do that. You say you you put out, you know put something out on Reddit. Hey, I'd really like to play an X. 
and always and there, there must be some kind of law like the GURPS law that someone will always come back and say yeah have you tried GURPS uh -oh. I haven't ha I haven't had as many people do do that to do that to me Pro probably because probably because I end up showing them my library and then they immediately shut up uh -oh. <laughs> I do I do recall there was there was one person who tr who tr the last time somebody brought it up was when I was lamenting how I was when I was doing the review for um Mongoose Traveler 2nd edition and I was go and I was going how the hell am I going to summarize Traveler's history <laughs> in 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 less than 3 minutes And technically speaking I I screwed up and I screwed up in that because because I I think I think I threw in 2300 AD which it which is and isn't part of Traveler but some but somebody said have have you considered have you considered covering Ger have you considered covering GURPS Traveler I'm like no that wasn't what I <laughs> prompt I said if I I said if I reached a thousand subs I would I would cover either either Mongoose Traveler second edition or Traveler 5.1 and democracy i put it up to a vote democracy went ran out so of so i'm, I'm not going to i'm not going to just pivot and cover gurps tra and cover gurps traveler just got a peer pressure <laughs> i i i have a confession that i've never played uh a traveler game in fact i might i may have read mongoose travel at some point um and i remember reading the character creation and the classic dying during character creation, um, but I've never played it, yeah. and it's something that I've, I'd, I'd quite like to get to the table at some point. To be fair, it, it to be fair, it can be a bit intimidating, um, mm. especially especially when it comes to all of the with how with how front loaded it is. The only problem I had with Mongoose Traveler Second was that was the core book should have been split into three instead instead of trying to do one core book. Mm. Now, obviously, that's not that's not as much of a problem now when when bundles are available. But try to, sure. but you're gonna have to dedicate a significant amount of page time just to the life path system alone. And yeah. that's not get that's not getting into advan to advancements and having to cover two different types of encounters, both on the ground and in space, and co and covering ships, and co and trying to give a primer on the third Imperium. That's a bit much for one book. Too much. And er, and I and earlier, which is why earlier editions, even the first, um, split it into three books. Um, a, a I think in the earliest ver one of the early versions that I, that I remember playing, there was a player's book, a GM book, and a third Imperium book. In the in the in the um, initial package. Hmm. And I. I don't I don't know why they didn't do why they didn't do that for for la for later ones. Some ga some games you can get you can get away with just having one core book. This wasn't one of them. Unless yeah. you want to have a core book that's the size of say Hero System. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Which you know the 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 two core books for Hero System 6th edition are about 600 pages each. I'm pretty. Sh I'm pretty sure that would be considered an offensive weapon in some places. Oh, absolutely. But it it is it is interesting. What I do find kind of interesting is is bringing it is doing doing an old school approach without without some of without some of the um, annoying part. Annoying, for lack of a better term, parts of of old school play, and I'm spe I'm specifically referring to how um how the the whole I've never I've never been a fan of what's considered the Vancian model of spellcasting. <laughs> it's very contentious, oh. um, and I've I've never necessarily been a fan either. Um, in romance, I got. I got rid of it for for spell points, but uh, I felt for to, for doing kind of a Jack Vancey game, it would be wrong 
to throw that kind of out entirely. But I think the way that that you know that that D and D does it, where you've got that kind of table of right, you'll get two level one spells at this level, and then you'll get three or oh, one level two spell at this level, and kind of that creep is still it 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 does irk me. And for for me for me the 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 irksome thing has has always been um how has always been how it justifies itself. Yes. Like, you look at you look at the dying earth books and magic in that sit in that setting is treated as this mathematics on steroids kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's just, it is a science. Really, mm-hmm. and the, well, the the problem is when you put now there is a big there is a bigger conversation about about how the more you what we call the more ubiquitous fantasy games don't know whether to shit or, shit or get off the pot regarding what kind of fantasy they are. Yes, because that I've put I've put it up on various social medias of what type of what type of fantasy is D, is D and D for instance, and some people will say that it's supposed to be sword and sorcery. Some people will say that it's supposed to be Tolkien esque. Some people will some people will say that it's supposed to be um that it's supposed that it's supposed to be some combination. And some people will say it can any any depending on your table. And that's that's the exact problem I'm getting at. <laughs> It's this uh, kind of melange of of kind of everything that you want to do, but being that it it then strips away its identity. You go back to O D and D, and to you know to some extent B X as well, where I think the game wore its sort of inspirations on its sleeve a little bit more. The appendix even, N. Even then, even then, it still it still had the problem of not having a world to to um fall back to fall back on. Yeah, well, that's that's right. I mean, the the, the world, I guess, the setting is a is a, is another thing. I think in terms of what it wanted to do uh, mechanically and what it expected uh, a player to do, you were you know you were essentially dirty dungeon delvers at some point, and you got experience through loot um and then you created a tower and then you probably did some um kind of uh i guess kingdom management for want of a better better word even though that didn't really have a whole lot of um rules for that in in those kind of core books i'd say um, i'd say axe does a better job of kingdom management than that did yeah yeah that's right um but yeah i think with with 5e and i don't really necessarily have anything against 5e as a game it's not really for me um but it's it, it does have that because it does want to be so broad as you say it, it doesn't it loses probably what attracted me to the kind of the game uh, or at least attracts me to some of the kind of the old school games, which is uh, a little bit more sword and sorcery, or a little bit more, yeah, science fantasy. Because science fantasy, the, that that is D and D. You know, that's it does have its roots in in kind of alien technology and, and things like that. What like uh, White Plume Mountain, um, and you know, it, I, I think it's kind of lost a lot of that. Oh, uh, well, the. The par- the way I tr- the way I often illustrate the whole the paradox of trying to be- of trying to um if you want if you want to claim that you're that you're trying to accommodate all kinds of fantasy that's fine but that's not something you can half ass the the um par- the paradox that I often bring to people is okay if it's supposed to be representing all kinds of fantasy then then riddle me th- then riddle me this. The most common way to equip to equip a fighter is sword and board. Now, how are you going to do that for, for say, a Japan-themed campaign where where shields aren't really a thing? Yeah, uh, or, or even uh, a kind of a Dark Ages theme where 
swords aren't really a thing and bows aren't really a thing too much. Mm-hmm. You know, spears, if you were doing that kind of thing. And actually, that I think, you know, when people talk about D&D being this sort of medieval game, the medieval period is, is so broad. I think you could, you could you could make lots of different kind of settings within that. I mean, hell, hell in the early, in the earliest days, you had you had um, you had Ar- you had Arneson ma- you had Arneson making one setting and Ga- and Gygax making a whole making a whole other, and the two of them yeah. have barely anything in common. Wildly different. Um, uh, and. I think I think the I think the whole all kinds of fantasy all kinds of fantasy is something that can only can only be created when you when you have a very li- when you have a very limited pool of fa- of um understanding when it comes to fantasy. Um around here we call this kind of thing the Tolkien melting pot. Yes, the epic fantasy which sort of I yeah. Don't- I don't have anything against Tolkien, obviously, but I but I've always had issue with the idea that that's what you're supposed to do for it to be fantasy. I remember, I remember running Planescape and people saying that being too weird to be considered fantasy. It should be considered science fiction. And and I think you know I read an interview with Alan Moore um, the other week, and actually he was making this point exactly that um, you know he's new book of short stories illuminations is ostensibly all of that is fantasy and and what he was saying is that well what you kind of think about fantasy now is is almost this robert jordan type tolkien thing whereas actually you know he was much more inspired by like the gorman ghast mm-hmm. trilogy and, and 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 things like that um that, that are weird um and you know aren't necessarily about these having different races or having this kind of world epic world world building that that Tolkien had. That is one flavor, and that's a flavor that say you know against the Dark Master does really well uh, in, in in you know emulating that kind of thing. Or the One Ring um, game sp- specifically does and specifically has uh, mechanics to manage that. Uh, and and to to actually you know create that kind of atmosphere. Whereas I think if you just kind of put it into say D and D, well, actually, if you're trying to do that kind of high fantasy, that you know melange of of Tolkien stuff, it's kind of half assed. You're not you're not really getting the full that full flavor. These epic journeys and 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 things like that. It's, it doesn't quite cater to it. Um, uh, and so it, it really pays to have, you know, when we talk about role playing games, to have systems that are very specific to to certain subgenres or, or or genres. And you know, as you say, recognizing that fantasy is way more than just uh, you're gonna have some orcs and you, you're gonna have some dwarves, and you know, dwarves are not gonna like elves. Ooh. Yeah. Um. I. I, one of the one of the games that's on my review bucket list to to that I want to explore down the road to kind of ex, to kind of reflect this is um, Talislanta. Yeah, they uh, they have no elves. Yeah, they, <laughs> I hear. They've, yeah, they've been using that. They've been using no elves as their as their marketing for for since day one, I think. Yeah, they have. <laughs> um, and if, and this is. Even though, even though this, even though this kind of this kind of thing is a factor with um, with fantasy, other other genres of storytelling and ga- and gaming are not are not immune to it. I um I distinct I distinctly remember um get getting a I, I remember getting a bit annoyed when I when um when so, when there was this mindset that if you were going to do a post apocalypse that you needed to have zombies and why even though it has its issues i really really liked um the genesis in part in, because yes it is a post apocalypse although i'd i'd say i'd say it's a post apocalypse that's removed to the point where new cultures are starting to form but 
the enemy is not is not zombies in that game. It's it's coked out mutants. Yeah, but the post apocalypse is, I guess, that other one that does get Tolkienized, but in a different way. Mm-hmm. Obviously, not Tolkien, but you know, as you say, it's either going to be uh, zombies or it's going to be uh, Mad Max. Badlands type thing, but actually, a, a, a post apocalypse can be a, a number of, of different things. It doesn't need to necessarily be arid wastelands and you're fighting for oil. Yeah, you can do interesting things with it. Uh, and I, th- I think, I think when um, when the Gen- when the Genesis had its at its second run, with, what the the term the term that they kept using was primal punk and. I think the art team had mentioned taking inspiration from Tarzan. Oh, I can't I can't source that claim, so take that with a grain of salt. But if you've seen what the Genesis looks like, I th- I think there's so- I think there's something to that. But sort of because um, it's a little bit um, I-, I guess a little bit Neolithic, isn't it? And it's, and it it's can, it sort of uh, the, the thing that the thing, the thing that's interesting with the Genesis is there isn't this mo- there isn't this mono tech level. There are some places that are full on Neolithic, whereas whereas other, whereas other places have 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 recovered to be to be kind of um kind of kind of this ne- kind of this neo medievalism. And mm. some places still ha- still have adva- still have advanced tech, but are trying to pe- are trying to piece together how it works. Not too far removed from how the how the mechanicus work in 40k. Just not just not as um, advanced, obviously, but still mm. still trying to piece t- still trying to piece together how how things like radio works when nobody knows how radio works. Yeah, but. One thing that one thing that I was curious of all the music, of all the musical inferences, why why go with um, Dio? God rest his soul. Uh, the man on the silver mountain. So the the whole reason why this game came up was because of the of the song Stargazer mm-hmm. uh, and the lyrics to that. Mm-hmm. Um, because that is incredible song, you know, Rainbow. Um, Rainbow Rising, and it's it was those that kind of uh, those lyrics. There's no sun in the shadow of the wizard. See how he glides, why he's lighter than air, and that immediately conjures this really interesting. The whole song conjures this interesting world, and there's no sun, and you know. Uh, and I know that Dio in in all these incarnations around Black Sabbath and and his own band, um, he, I think Children of the Sea specifically says, "Look out, the sun's going black." Uh, and and through Dio, um, it was kind of piecing together this kind of alternate uh, sort of world. It's like, okay, well, actually, you could take Dio's lyrics as talking about this. The the, the 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 dying earth situation the sun is you know going out and there are wizards and uh you know everybody has these philosophies around time being a never-ending wheel which is something that comes up a lot mm-hmm. in dio's lyrics and you know you know dio's great he you know his music's uh incredible and i've been listening to it for a, for a long long time um and i kind of wanted to do something to uh i guess show my appreciation for for Dio, um, uh, but also something that was, you know, heavily inspired by his music and a, lo- a lot of the the stuff that's in here, um, kind of the, the the creatures and the um, the spells are specifically um, inspired by by him. So, like some of the spells, Master of the Moon, mm-hmm. um, Evil Eyes, Fever Dream, uh, Sacred Heart. Things like that, they're all, you know, these are all Dio songs, or they're Dio lyrics, or, like, Look Out um, is just something that Dio, you know, repeats often in a lot of his lyrics. Uh, and 
you know, I, I think it Dio makes for fertile fertile ground when it comes to creating these these worlds because it was something that he was doing himself. Mm-hmm. And well, he w- he wasn't the on- he wasn't the only one. I mean, I'm not sh- I'm not sure if it e- if it ever released, but there but I'd like to hope that one of these days I actually some either either through a leak or or through something official um we actually the public is actually able to see what the rye story that um Mer- that Freddie Mercury was was writing entailed yeah yeah well that's a, that's an interesting one because um i've been listening to some of you know queen's very early albums and they are very soul and sorcery <laughs> in some in some cases great yeah and i've of of course of course you can you can just pick you can just pick a power metal act in the last 40 years and they probably have some sort of um their narrative work somewhere along there obviously some 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 bands have it more than others look looking straight at you luca turilli and all this <laughs> shit you did with, Rhaps- with rhapsody you absolute madman <laughs> um, and of, co- of course, the patient zero is keeper of the seven keys, which I ended up yeah. making a whole campaign of a long t- out of a long time ago. Hey, that's good inspiration. Uh, and a- about a year ago, I found out that somebody took um, the fo- the follow up to keeper of the seven keys um, part three and ter- and turned that into a doom map, <laughs> which and. Of- of course, of course, there's um, there's the, I think I think the ultimate case in point is the fact that, on the Mork Borg um d- Discord server, there w- there was the there was this concept of album crawls that was explored. Basically, you make it you make a one you make a one off sometimes one page dungeon based solely on a music album. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's something I, I'd not seen that, but it it is something that occurred to me for um for one page dungeon specifically for Stargazer, um you know to to essentially do okay well what would you know the last in line look like you know what would Holy Diver look like as a uh, as a dungeon? It's interesting. And i i do I do recall that um I. I don't know if I don't know if it came to be, but I remember an announcement a couple of years ago about Holy Diver being made into a comic, based on, based on Dio's writings. I don't know if I don't know if it actually came out though. Mm, no, I, I haven't. I've not seen it. I think, uh, it, yeah, it was a while ago, wasn't it? Now, uh, um, I'm just having a Google and seeing whether it's uh, around. So there is a co- yeah there is, it, there is one. Apparently, apparently yeah, it is the, out and on sale. Is, um, and it look yeah, and it looks it looks like the standard edition isn't isn't um too, isn't too isn't too pricey. I mean, I'm seeing I'm seeing prices of it for for around for around twenty USD. Yeah, it's about twenty twenty five pounds over here. Mm-hmm. Uh But the one of the one of the other things that I, I will admit I did I did get a, I did get a bit of enjoyment out of going through um, Stargazer is having a and this is something a lot of a lot of old school style games don't consider having a having subtypes for the for the pri, for the primary archetypes. I mean, obviously mm. you don't have you don't have all four. You hit you just have. Um, scoundrel, magician, and wayfarer, which is basically your basically the warrior, rogue, and mage trinity. But a lot of old school games will stop will stop it right at there. So, yeah, and the the reason why I did that, that was because I wanted some some level of kind of skills in there, but not necessarily you know a list of skills or anything like that but you know when if we're thinking about something like Kugel the Clever in you know in Jack Vance you know Eyes of the Other World things like that 
uh, you know, he's you know he's a, he's a scoundrel. He's not necessarily uh, a kind of uh, d- sort of D and D thief. Um, but, you know, you have a scoundrel who is a thief, or a scoundrel who is an assassin, or a weaver who is more of a, kind of a bard, but, but sort of, sort of not. Um, and, you know, similarly with Wayfarer, I, I think having just, you know, fighting man or fighter or whatever, wasn't necessarily something that fit in super well with the, the kind of the, the dying earth thing. Um, so rather than have that, it was choosing or rolling for soldier probably being the closest thing to that. But you know, hunter and nomad, these are pe- all people who would be you know mercenaries, wanderers, um, going from place to place, hiring themselves out in in some way. So I want some just some a little bit of flavour um, to each of them. You know, a diabolist. You specifically dealing with demons. Um, but knowing that this wasn't going to be a particularly long uh, book as well, it, you know, I wanted to keep it to a short page count, so I didn't really want to go too far into. Okay, well, a Diablo is going to be a, a specific class, and you know, they're going to have this and that. I didn't really think it needed it in that kind of the old school way. Yeah, it's just I've seen I've um a question that a question that I've often asked a lot of folk is the, is how do you is how you manage having um, having it so that you can have two people in the same um, archetype or class or what have you, and have them feel different. Mm-hmm. And whenever I bring that up, people usually bring up that you can make them make them different through role play, but that that always feels like a bandage. Yeah, I mean, you can make anything different through through role play. Um, and I guess with you know in, in Stargazer's case, the the you know the only real change mechanically is that you're getting these these kind of skills. But I think what I'd want players to do is is really lean on that, lean on the fact that uh, they're a mage, and well, you know they're getting advantage to checks with dealing with aristocrats. So what does that mean for a mage? Well, you're, you're probably a little bit well off yourself. Um, you have a you know a smooth tongue. You're um, you're you're probably quite well respected within the aristocracy, and just almost having um, the players eke out that that flavour just from that that short description, and and I think therein sort of lies the differentiation with okay, well on a party you could have uh, a, a a nomad and a soldier because it would probably make sense that you're going to have um, someone who can. Do good tracking, but also um, when they come across a, a village full of people that they've never seen before, and not to kind of scare them off, there's somebody who can then go and and talk to them and and um, you know find out what what thing what mishaps have you know befallen them there, and what kind of quests they can potentially get. Where you've got a soldier who um, is more around, you know, noticing people while they're traveling and. You know, smashing things up, killing things, that yeah. kind of thing. You know, you're a soldier. You know what you are. Mm-hmm. You know, if 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 you t- if you tell to tell a player right, you are a soldier, then automatically you have a lot of kind of baggage there in that term. Whereas with a nomad or a wayfarer, you kind of have, or sorry, a hunter, you have very different um, kind of very different preconceptions of what they are, uh, and that's all kind of using this very short page space really and, and and short word count in order to to get that across to people and hopefully they do and hopefully they you know they play it that way mm-hmm. uh, but of course of, of course the, of course in the, in doing that you're able to make someone who plays the ranger archetype without sucking at it <laughs> hopefully yeah I mean, I I realize that I realize that is that is that is low hanging fruit, but to to re- to reference a to re- to reference um an old an old line, I'm not trying to hit a man while he's down. I'm trying to kick him because that's easier. <laughs> and well, the ra- the ranger has has had sucking problems since A D and D. 
I play a ranger in. Um, we have a weekly Pathfinder second second edition game, uh, and I, I I really like what they did with with rangers there, uh, and because I think what what tends to happen is that rangers go between that you can never kind of find a, a slot for what a ranger is a lot of the time. Um, you know, are they are they kind of wilderness hunters who you know use their bow and maybe double daggers or whatever um are they similar to that but do they use spells and and and, and things like that um uh, and they can be you know i think that you know the prototypical ranger i think is is often either seen as uh robin hood or aragon two very different um archetypes there you know aragon being kind of the the ranger very rarely, if ever, uses a bow. Um, and he's very kind of much that tracking kind of guy. I think the way that they've done it with uh, Pathfinder Second Edition has been good in that, you know, um, you have, you you sort of have some, you can have some sort of very light magical abilities that, that help you, but it's, um, you know, I, I, I play a kind of a, a two-handed sword wielder that their main mechanic is around hunting their prey but their whole thing is they're a they're a hunter um if you take that kind of archetype but there's lots of different ones that you can take but my, the whole thing is that I, i'm going to make you my i'm going to hunt you to the ends of the earth uh and that's not necessarily just a kind of a combat mechanic either although it is um it could be someone that you're specifically you know trailing for days and days and you're you're getting bonuses because you know they're your prey or whatever and it kind of every all your class features and, and feats and things all kind of ladder up to to that and I, i've i've enjoyed that but i remember playing one in third edition and that yeah wasn't great and and i think with the i think the first like adventure in fifth edition was pretty bad as well um uh. AD and the AD and D Ranger started. Um, some are, some have argued it started the at death's door rule because of of how AC was how how AC worked didn't work well with its kit, so the Ranger kept getting itself killed. Uh, mm. The th- the three E was it was a mess. The three point five what was the three point five version was a mess, but overall, I think I think the I've always said I've always said that the big that the big problem with um with ra- with rangers is class based design doesn't fit doesn't fit well with characters that are supposed to be jack of all trades. Yeah. See also the bard for that for that problem. But yeah. moreover um I've I've and I th- I think I said this to you in the past. Stuff like favorite enemy works in reverse. Because of the fact that it's that it's hyper focusing on one particular enemy type, you're operating under the assumption that that one enemy type is going to be present. Yeah, that's right, and that takes a lot of consideration from the for the GM or the DM as well. Okay, well, you know, I don't want this person to you know feel like they've taken this, they've got this feature they can't really use but then again i don't want to make it too easy by just you know artificially filling my campaign with orcs or whatever it is i've i've argued for the longest time i've i've argued that instead instead of do, instead of doing some numbers go up with this one specific um enemy type it should it should be that there are certain benefits you can that you technically have access to, but they're but they're only available if that enemy type is around. I you're not picking a specific one. It's something that is something that should activate when that enemy is around. Yeah, yeah. And I think it works a little better anyway if you've got a a smaller pool of of enemies, or if you just got if you just have enemy types. Hmm. I think the the issue potentially with Something like D and D, where the the number of enemies are, you know, it's huge. 
and the more settings they put out and the more i guess out there settings you know they've just you know put out spell jammer and i'm not entirely sure how it would work with pages and and things from say spell jammer there if they're gonna i, I don't know uh but then again I've, I've not read 5e in a long time so i'm sure it does in some way but it does feel limiting yeah and There, there is, there is one, there is one project I, I can think of that's taking that's taking a better approach, but I'll get to that another day. Um, something, something else, something, something I was, I was, a, I was a bit curious about is, for, first off, the whole, the whole thing of tr of getting XP from treasure fa from treasure um, found, and second. Unless I'm mis unless I just happened to miss it, I didn't I didn't see and I didn't see anything about a um about about any sort any sort of currency system. Everything seems everything revolves around treasure in this in this setting. Scott, did I lose you? So I guess I, I I don't I don't like fiddly things in games, and I think that sometimes um, treasure itself can be when I mean coins um, and just buying things can be a little bit. A little bit, a little bit fiddly, um, and I. But I also thought that in kind of this feudal, uh, post-apocalyptic essentially, um, uh, sort of setting, it would probably be more bartering and actually people wanting, um, you know, status essentially being predicated on having just lovely things lovely treasure from you know the times past and the only way you could really get that is from delving into times past essentially going back in time by delving deep into the sort of the dungeons below um so kind of the whole thing is based on you're essentially treasure hunting a lot of the time so if you're a, a magician the whole thing for a magician is that you're looking for black discs because black discs are rare uh, but they also contain um magic in the form that they are essentially vinyls mm -hmm. and they're more to the point they are dio vinyls <laughs> you know essentially you're, you're going you're going into dungeons to find um you know heaven and hell black sabbath um uh, uh, and that kind of thing so it, it was more like how could how could I make treasure more of a status thing than anything, uh, and then kind of anything that you're trying to buy, you know, food and board and things like that, uh, ju you know, just barter for it. Or even better, it allows you to then, or it allows the GM, or in this case the SG, the Stargazer um, themselves, to say okay well actually yeah you can have food and board here for a week however i've got an issue or um you know maybe t you know help someone um in in need and, and have that kind of trade essentially you're you are mercenaries um for want of a better term um so and, and then of course with with tying into xp xps um it's, as you say you know it's, it's based around treasure it's based around locations um as well so the more you explore the more xp you get um and also kind of people you encounter so rather than i suppose spell it all out and say well you know you're you're going to be going around well I, I kind of do mention it in the in the game but the, the whole mechanics around it are predicated on you going around or the party going around Finding new places, helping out new people, um, and and diving for treasure and getting XP for it, and not specifically killing monsters, um, because I think that you know that's an issue in itself. Where 
okay, well, all I'm going to do is go and, and slaughter every monster I can see rather than trying to figure an in interesting way around something. You know, in in this case, you know, you are... F this, is, this is an old-school game. You're, you're fairly weak. Um, if you do come across a, a, a monster, you're probably going to get killed in some way unless you're really smart about it. And that comes, you know, back to these... Um, sort of the, the old the more old school D D way of thinking where you're trying to to get an advantage in some way against whatever, you know, whatever creatures you come across. So whether that be you're trying to charm them or, you know, you're gonna uh trade information with them or you you know you're gonna get them on side in terms of faction or or yeah or indeed you decide to um go toe to toe with them. So that that's kind of why I I did it in the way that I did it with you know how treasure works and things and XP works. Yeah. And I think the I think the reason I f I find that in that interesting is even even in games that cl that that w that would scream to the high heavens that it's about the story you still need to have some kind of chase. I remember I remember my teacher talk, talking about talking about three pillars that are important with plot is um goal, stakes and urgency. And even even if you're even if you're just wandering fr from from pl from place to place in the in any specific adventure having at, at least an attempt at at those three is is a way to keep people engaged. Hmm. Cuz Obvious, obviously, I'm not. I'm not saying that you need to have some overarching story. But if we're, if you're drawing from pulp, then you have a you have a built-in framework. The what the the cowboy or the wanderer coming coming in to solve a problem before leaving. And it, and it can be as as simple as that. And I think some of the best pulp stories are incredibly simple. They tended to be. You know the insti instigation for the action tended to be um, a a very simple thing: trying to get something back, mm -hmm. trying to get revenge, trying to get something that something somebody owes you. Um, it doesn't have to be necessarily particularly convoluted, yeah. um, and nor should it be. I think you can have a, a a very good, incredibly fun adventure with the very basics that pulp gives you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a, 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 a fairly simple antagonist, uh, an interesting locales, uh, and just some, you know, some good, um, f you know, cannon fodder, some, you know, good action, uh, and, you know, s some some cool MacGuffin at the end of it. Um, no... At the risk of sounding a bit too American, in a lot of in a lot of westerns, the the her the hero who's coming to town um, doesn't want to get dra doesn't want to get dragged into things, but th but just by being a outside element, they end up getting dragged into it. Mm. There's plenty of there's plenty of times where the where the stranger comes comes in and just and just wants a place to sleep for the night, and things end up get things end up escalating. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And I can I can very easily see that see that with that's that's the kind of thing that do, that doesn't that isn't limited to just westerns. It's just, it's just it's just that's it's a very it's a very easy way to get to um get the message across because. Everybody knows about the Dollars trilogy in one form or another, and everybody's heard Ennio Morricone's music, even if they didn't know it. And at, at this point, that kind of thing is is ingrained into culture. It's essentially folklore now. Mm -hmm. Well, that kind of thing. I remember, I remember Joseph Campbell making making a remark that. The comparing the Western to a modern fairy tale, and as some as somebody who's 
who's de who delved into way too many fa way too many fairy tales as a kid and even as an adult, I can I can certainly see it. Even even if um, there, even if there's a tw certain twisted part of me that wa that that wants to in that would that um, le that likes introducing people to to the or to the original takes on certain fairy tales they ha they they read through as kids. The, yeah, the, the the proper Grimm's. Yeah, the whether it be the Grimm's versions. or the, or, um. I think that I think there was, there there was one. I think there was one time where I um, I had introduced a I had introduced an old friend of mine, and it's a miracle that they're still my friend, <laughs> after this. <laughs> to um, because they they had they all that they had known about the Hunchback of Notre Dame was the Disney movie. And then I introduced them to the original story. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Is that evil? Yes. And I apologize for nothing. I, but I think that's a... It, it's an interesting thing, though. Um, b because it is that, that Disneyfication is what people, it's what people know. Um, and a lot of these stories... You know when the Grimm brothers were collecting, um, you know these uh, folk tales essentially uh, at the time. The, these weren't necessarily stories that were told to children. These were stories that were told among adults on you know cold winter's nights where there was nothing else to do. Um, so they, they're gonna have the kind of this gore and and, and things in them, and of course you know it was they were passed down to children because a lot of them were. You know, kind of warnings in some way, but a lot. You know, I'd say a lot, a lot of them were because consider consider the threats that were that were in that were in certain forests and the infamy of say the Black Forest in Germany. Yeah, uh, and and that and that and that is universal really for anyone. You know, if these are people who don't, you know, it, it was a completely different time when people didn't necessarily have. They definitely did not have access to the internet. They didn't necessarily have access to books. Um, so, uh, you know, it bears these tales kind of bed repeating, really. And it wasn't necessarily just for, you know, young kids. It was for people who actually, yeah, you know what? You don't go out into the forest, otherwise you're going to get either, you know, murdered by uh, brigands or, or whatever, or, you know, Whoever it is, or, or you know, eaten by wolves, mm -hmm. bears, <laughs> or or anything like that. Oh, I've I've um, I've had my I've had my fair share of horror stories told told to me about um about bears over over the years, and I've um some some people have looked at me like I was crazy when I said that growing up, werewolves scared me more than vampires. The reason being is. I lived I lived in places that had a lot of forest. So and and what and th and things like things like stray wolves aren't weren't uncommon. So in that and, kind and, of environment a werewolf would be would be something to be more scared of. And this is and this is exactly why you know folk tales are so effective and and how you know they come into being in the first place it's that kind of that sense of place the it's that communication between the, the place itself uh, and and the people there and and the you know the fears that that engenders so as you're saying if you're surrounded more by by forests then the thing that is going to be immediately threatening to you is going to be the scariest thing yeah so werewolves it is whereas with vampires i mean yeah, there, yeah. There's the whole blood sucking and ba and bats thing, but I was never in an environment where I'd be dealing with a whole lot of bats. Not many castles on hills. Yeah. No, no. Which is which is a bit which is a bit ironic considering one of the images I use to represent the temple is the um, Tasgang Temple in Tibet. I probably mispronounced that, but. You, but um, I just I just thought it was an I just thought it was an appropriate metaphor. But <laughs> now you'd 
I do want to I do want to give my give my congrats that um that you're able to put able to put out um Stargazer since putting out anything is not, is not easy. Um what do you have cook what do you have cooking down the road? Um thank you. Uh, and I, well I, I suppose yeah the most the most immediate one is um the secrets of the golden throne mm -hmm. uh with uh, you know, against the Master team, uh, which has very fortunately, you know, funded on Kickstarter, which is great. So hopefully, you know, we, they can the team can crack some of those um, stretch goals. Um, there's, uh, I do have something else that's coming out, um, or at least coming to Kickstarter sometime next week. Uh, next week, no. <laughs> next year um i can't say too much about that but it is in the old school vein uh it's something i'm incredibly excited about um kind of working with this uh this publisher it's right on my street um and yeah it's um yeah it's definitely in my wheelhouse um and yeah the the, the kind of the the big project that i'm working on again is all under and NDA and not out for a couple of years yet. So, um, however, beyond that, there's sort of little bits of support that I'm doing for some of the other games that uh, that I do. So I'm going to be doing a little bit more in terms of putting some Quill stuff out um, in English Eerie. So just putting out some scenarios for them. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be putting out a couple of sort of the one page booklets um, for both Heartseeker. Uh, which is my kind of other old school game, um, and also Stargazer. So there'll be a couple there, and you know we talked to, sort of about those. Um, I think before the podcast we were talking about uh, sort of album. You know what what would an album look like uh, as a uh, as a scenario? Um, so you know this is going to be what would a do do album look would look like as a sort of a scenario or, or a dungeon. Um, and also a little bit of, for uh, Wired Neon Cities Ultimate Edition as well, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, came out last week, uh, which is just a kind of a, a redo of my original Wired Neon Cities, which I brought out in, I think, 2017 now. It was a while ago. So I, what I'm wanting to do is kind of go through some of these um, older games that I've done and update them a little bit. So whether that's, you know, stylistically or graphic graphical wise um layout wise because a lot of those games i was doing with sort of powerpoint um and that's kind of how i was laying it out because i didn't have any um adequate software uh, back then but um now i now i have software i use and a lot more experience in in doing that um, I'm sort of going back through that catalogue and updating things and um, just refreshing some of the mechanics as well that may have been a little bit more clunky or, you know, maybe I've had a, a, a different idea uh, around what, you know, something that could improve the game. So with Wide Neon Cities Ultimate Edition, there were a few uh, elements that I just changed outright in that just based on just a little bit more of the experience that I've had in game design over the last few years or so. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot to keep me busy at the moment. Yeah. As well as having a day job. <laughs> <laughs> of, co of course. Yeah. Uh, but I want to thank you once again for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way up to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. Oh, it's uh, always a pleasure. The, the air up here is sweet. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here... Drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And I'll cheers to that with my uh, glass of water. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.